Great. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, that's that's the best uh, part to start with. That we are um, going to build a relationship. One or two of these names and faces are starting to become familiar. But I hope over time that all of you, or as many as possible, of you will become familiar. So thank you for taking the time to come out uh, to this engagement. Thank you for the invitation to Marissa. Um, let me just start off by acknowledging a couple of people. David, uh, very nice to meet you. Thanks for the for the intro. I'll work on the bucky side of things. So, <laughs> but uh, but 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 no fruitless and wasteful expenditure. So this one will have to be completely broken by the time we look we look at a bucky. Um, to the colleagues from Home Affairs, thank you for joining me. Um, I think especially on the trusted employer scheme, scheme, there's a lot to be proud of. So I'm I'm really glad, great to have, have Mr. Mbele here with me today. Ambassadors and high commissioners, business leaders, as we've heard, distinguished guests and the media who have joined us. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, I must be honest with you, I've, I, there is a speech here, but um, it's not really always my style. And I think especially now, I would like to this be really to feel like an engagement. So um, I've got some ideas that I'd like to touch on with you, but it will hopefully feel more like I'm actually having a conversation with you rather than talking at you. So, so I think we'll take it in, in, in that vein. Um, and then, of course, when the questions come, we, we will um, have a further opportunity to go into specific areas that are relevant to everyone here. I think it's important to start um, by re-emphasizing some of the vision uh, that, that I've put on the table in this first few weeks, because I think it is very important uh, when you tackle anything like this, but especially a department like Home Affairs, which um, you know is not necessarily seen as the most efficient in the country, to have a real vision of where you want to go. And for me, the word dignity has really encapsulated, uh, I think, the different aspects of Home Affairs and, and what should guide us as we go through the reform process that we need. And uh, that is dignity for everyone. Um, You'll be happy to know, Marissa, that the reason I was 10 minutes late, which I hate and I'm sorry about, uh, but it was for good reason, because I had a fantastic engagement this morning uh, with uh, the, the backlog team at Home Affairs. Um, and I must tell you, uh, when I talk about dignity, it starts with the officials that work at Home Affairs, the people who actually have to make the system work. And I am enormously encouraged um, about the energy that I think is there. Uh, this morning in, in, in walking into the room where the backlog team actually exists, it's, it's such a fantastic thing to see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing about 60 people were there, you'll correct me, that was my rough reading uh, of that. But imagine 60 committed South Africans sitting under one roof trying to solve a problem that will help grow the economy. What a fantastic thing to actually experience. Uh, so dignity for Home Affairs officials is, is, is one of those. I said to them that, in my humble opinion, the 60 people in that room actually are, right now, the most powerful group of economic enablers in South Africa, if you think about it. You find me another group of 60 people with the ability to fix one of the fundamental constraints we face to economic growth. Uh, I don't think you will. I think it's in that room, in that Hallmark building. And so it was really fantastic to see the energy, the motivation. People were cheering and singing. It was just wonderful. And I, I said to them, let's have Christmas without a backlog. <laughs> I think we'll all have a much better Christmas if we can engineer that. And that is certainly the commitment that we're working towards. So dignity is important to me for our officials. That does not say that we mustn't deal with corruption. I think it's right front and center. Uh, I think we know the consequences thereof um, are devastating for everyone involved. And so Caring about the dignity of staff does not mean that you don't have zero tolerance for corruption. You can do both. And that's a theme you'll hear from me often today, is that we must walk and chew at the same time. This tendency of reducing everything in life to a binary choice between one or the other uh, is an issue that we will overcome at Home Affairs. You can both respect your staff and 
uh, be serious and firm about dealing with malfeasance. And, and that's the approach there. But dignity extends far beyond the people who are behind the desks and, and on the other side of your emails and, and everything that you have to do with home affairs. Uh, dignity goes to the heart of what we must do for South African citizens who rely on us for civic services. So before we even get uh, to the economic component, which I'll spend most of my time focusing on, uh, the three components of this department are worth mentioning and how dignity fits into all of those. It is undignified when you stand in a queue for six hours and then you get to the front of, a, of the queue and they tell you the system is offline. It's an infringement on dignity. That's, that's the reality. Uh, it is undignified for our clients when that happens, when they need basic civic services to enable their lives, when corruption, identity theft takes away their opportunity to obtain an ID or a birth certificate. There's a massive infringements on dignity. Um, and so on the civic branch of this department, it is something that we must focus on. The same goes for the security element. Uh, Home Affairs has a clear and important role to play in national security. It is part of the security cluster, uh, and for very good reason. Uh, we have to have managed processes of immigration at our borders. We face massive challenges there, and it is equally a matter of dignity for someone, firstly, who wants to legally enter the country, to do so in a way that is not a nightmare experience. Uh, but secondly, then, also, it is an infringement on dignity for all of us to live in a country where we don't feel secure, where the management of the state and the sovereign um, leaves a lot to be desired. So that too is about dignity. And then finally, I think the main topic that, that we'll chat about here today is really the economic side. Um, and there is nothing that gives dignity like a job, let me tell you that. It gives meaning to your life, it gives you a reason to get up in the morning, it gives you pride in providing for your family. And at the same time, unemployment is the biggest infringement on dignity in South Africa. 32% on the narrow definition, we all know the statistics, young people over 60% in, according to some definitions who cannot find work is a massive violation of dignity. And so I think on this third component, uh, it is one that has been neglected in, in terms of thinking about home affairs, but I am absolutely committed to putting it right up there with the other two. In other words, civic services, uh, national security, and economic enabling uh, role of home affairs. Those are the three arms. And in each of them, the vision and the pursuit must be dignity. And for you, that is relevant in how you interact with obtaining all these permits that you need, um, making sure those processes are secure, reliable, efficient, and that you actually have a dignified experience. I, I've, I've had the privilege of traveling in my life, and uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I've ever found a case where it is truly an absolute pleasure to fill in forms and, 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 and all of that, but you certainly have better and worse experiences. And I think if we can bring more dignity to that aspect <coughs> in recognition, of the economic role of this department, then I think we would have gone a long way um, to making our contribution to South Africa. I want to pause here for a moment to reflect on this, uh, on this point. The, the, the sheer scale of the opportunity um, for the South African economy. I think one of the things that is clear from the government of national unity and I suppose it's worth mentioning that perhaps it's kind of weird to some of you to have a minister standing here who's from the Democratic Alliance. Um, but I can tell you it's getting less weird by the day. And I think that that's a good sign. Uh, because in the government of national unity, we have, I think, achieved something remarkable for South Africa, which is a peaceful transfer of power. And we should not underestimate the significance of that. Uh, things could have gone differently. Um, and I think... One of the things that gives me great encouragement from the GNU perspective is how job creation is at the absolute apex. It is the number one priority, growing the economy and creating jobs. And it's for a very simple reason, because it is the biggest crisis. So you start, like with anything in life, with priorities, and we have to prioritize job creation. Now, there are many other ministers in this government, some would say too many, 
And they all have a role to play. All these departments have a role to play in job creation. I think Home Affairs potentially has the, has, the, has the potential to surprise a lot of people through what we can do if we embrace that third arm of this department, which is economic uh, growth and enabling um, investment, tourism, skills attraction. And the reason I say that is because while people would obviously think about national treasury, trade and industry, these are hardcore economic portfolios. If you look at National Treasury's research, where they asked, I think, a very simple but fundamental question, which was, which interventions have the highest payoffs? In other words, what are the things we can do that yield the quickest benefits in terms of creating jobs and growing the economy? They obviously found ending load shedding to be number one. I don't think anyone is shocked by that. And I think it's worth acknowledging that there is progress being made in that regard. But number two, was not Transnet. It was not the ports. It was not crime. Those things are all important, but it turns out skills was number two. Addressing South Africa's urgent skills shortage is after load shedding, the single most transformative intervention we can have at this juncture in South African history. Now, maybe those things change over time. We'd love to produce more skills in South Africa. I think that's fundamentally part of what needs to happen in the higher education sector, for example. But we are facing an immediate crisis right now that if we don't address unemployment and use every lever at our disposal to lower the rate of unemployment, grow the number of people with jobs and growing the economy in the process, our country will not be secure until we have done that. And so... Realizing that National Treasury themselves say this, I think is a, is a very important starting point. Um, and then taking into account that the GNU statement of intent identifies job creation as the apex priority, it is a no brainer to say, well, what can we do? What can we do in this department? Not in neglecting the other two arms, which are fundamental to the experience of South Africans in their own country, but what can we do to contribute to this apex priority. Now, there are some studies that say that if you, if you attract, I think it's 11,000 more critical skilled, in the, critically skilled individuals to South Africa per year. So I think it's about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 a year at the moment. If you grow that number to 11,000, uh, by 11,000, so let's, let's say to 16,000, that that single intervention adds 1.2% to annual GDP growth. Now, just to put that in context, annual GDP growth right now is 0.6%. So you are telling me that you have the potential with an intervention that triples economic growth by doing something that does not sound completely impossible to me. I mean, it's not easy, but surely is within the realm of possibility. Then you add on top of that the tourism aspect and growing tourism to South Africa by 10% can unlock 0.6% unlock GDP growth. I mean, we are talking here about quadrupling South Africa's economic growth through fixing home affairs and specifically positioning it as an economic enabler. That sounds like a damn good deal to me. I must be very honest with you. If that's our apex priority and if we're serious about saying that by the end of the GNU's term, we want to look back and say, if there's one thing we've done is we've created jobs then surely that is the mandate that we should pursue. And <coughs> I must say to you that I am not a lone voice in the desert on this, you'll be happy to hear, uh, when it comes to the GNU and, and to the government. Um, I'd like to quote to you what the president said in his state of, well, it's not, wasn't the state of the nation, it was the opening of parliament, um, where he said the following, and I quote, where the skills we need are not immediately available, we need to attract people with appropriate qualifications and experience. We will continue with the visa reforms introduced in the last few years to attract skills and investment and grow the tourism sector. And in a separate part of his speech, he mentioned that we must remove every obstacle that stands in the way of achieving the apex priority. I can also say to you that it is very clear to me that this understanding has permeated government more broadly. That this crisis 
and conversely, the opportunity is one that is central to the agenda that we need to pursue. And that gives me great hope because it means even as we're busy with our teething problems, getting to know each other in the government of national unity, we are united on a couple of key topics. And I make it my business to make sure that this is one of them. So I think that is enormously encouraging for all of us in this room to understand. As I say, it's not a lone voice in the desert. It is, it is the consensus view of what needs to be done. Now, I do want to pause for a moment and touch on the backlog, uh, the visa backlog. There's more than one backlog in home affairs, I can tell you that. But let's talk about one. <laughs> Take it one at a time. Um, the meeting I had this morning and where Mr. Mbele was as well, I think uh, just re-emphasized to me that we can do this. And I want to say that we must view this particular intervention <clears throat> as a case study, a little ecosystem on its own of how we will drive reform in home affairs. Because this project brings together people from different departments, different branches. It brings in private sector support, for which I'm very grateful, uh, the BUSA delegates that are here. And it has brought those people around the table and it is working in a systematic way to actually achieve a clearly defined goal, which is no backlog by Christmas. That, no, that's a goal we should all support. So in looking at how that project has been tackled, I think we see the seeds of, of the reform process that we must now nurture. And I'll, I can tell you, one of the issues at the beginning is that it, it, the system is so fragmented that you could not quantify the backlog. If you said, what is the permitting backlog at a particular date? You were dealing with paper-based applications. You were dealing with things overseas. I mean, quite literally scattered around the world. That's, that, that's, that was step one, was getting a sense of how big this, this beast is. It turned out it was 306,000 or so. And then, of course, you then have to start working through this. But what I love about this project is that it is clear to me that the officials, they are not only concerned with achieving this goal. They are also looking very meticulously at how do we learn from how we hopefully achieve this goal and what are the reforms that we can see are necessary that flow from this. And that, I think, is where the longer term importance of this project comes from. And I would like to say that if we get this right, firstly, you should, I would encourage you to really applaud home affairs if we get this right. Don't applaud now. Don't you dare applaud now. <laughs> if there's no, if there's no, not no Christmas by backlog, if there's no backlog by Christmas, I genuinely call really, and I sincerely mean this, to reach out to people at home affairs and say, well done, because it is a hellish problem that they, that they faced. Now, if we get there, I think we must understand it as a springboard, as a moment to say, not only to ourselves, we can do this, but secondly, let's now take these lessons forward. And just to indicate to you how good the investment is, and I suppose some of the BUSA people would especially like to know what they're getting for helping us. Um, this number is not watertight, but some calculations have been done that I was told about this morning, that if you take the number of applications that are now being processed through the backlog project, and you quantify the investment into that and what it costs in terms of uh, salaries and, and everything else, it works out, and this, this number is inflated, the actual number is lower, but let's take 96 Rand per outcome. Now, when I heard this, I said, let's just pause on this for a second, because what, what does this actually mean? It means that the Kuberg engineers who had to ensure the safety of, of Africa's only nuclear power plant for the next 20 years cost 96 Rand to get them into this country. Now that is an investment that you can never beat. Go out and quantify the economic value of one of those engineers and what they've done at Kuberg. And then you say that 96 Rand was a joke. It's free, absolutely free. And that perspective, I think, reinforces why we can have confidence in what the numbers tell us about economic growth. Because look at the inputs, 96 Rand, 
This is the output there. It's a basic, basic calculation. I can also say that we are currently in an environment where we are processing about 15 to 16,000 of these applications per month. We have the capacity to go up very dramatically if we get some of the internal regulatory changes that we're looking at. And I'm not going to give you the number right now because I believe in under-promising and over-delivering rather than the other way around. But I hope that in the next few weeks we'll be able to indicate to you that we are making really substantial progress on this backlog. Now, let me remind you again why I'm focusing so much on this. It's not only because of the backlog. It's because of building confidence that we are serious. And it is because of using that confidence to then back ourselves and say we can improve this system. Now, how do we actually do that? What do I mean when I say that we go from hopefully a successful backlog clearing project to a fundamentally better system? I summarize that with four letters, SARS, South African Revenue Service. What we have at Home Affairs at its core is a system processing problem, which is indistinguishable. If you take out the specific environment, indistinguishable from what the South African Revenue Service faced in the early 2000s. It was a paper-based system um, I'm happy to report that I was too young to pay taxes back then. <laughs> but the tax return, I'm told, was 100 pages. Uh, 100 pages that you have to fill in. Now, how different is that to a home affairs application? I'll leave you to decide on that. 100 pages and look at it today. And not only look at it today, actually look at it since the early 2010s. What SARS was able to do was to take 100 pages paper-based, which was vulnerable to all the same problems we have at Home Affairs, because as soon as you have a paper-based thing, the easiest thing to do is to take the paper and put it under the desk and say, now, if you want this paper to go somewhere, you're going to give me something. That's, that's the environment, that's, and that's what SARS was facing. What they managed to do was to reduce firstly those 100 pages to two pages that are now pre-populated online if you go onto e-filing and build probably the world's most sophisticated and definitely earliest online tax administration. Um, I'm told the United States is kind of realizing right now that you need a thing like this. Um, but, but, but SARS was right there. Now I say to you, if SARS could do it, why can't Home Affairs do it? And more importantly, if South Africa could do it, why can't it do it again? Because SARS was not something that fell from the sky. It was local people partnering with local skills, local firms, putting together project teams like the one I hope we are building through the backlog project and meticulously working through and building the system that's required. So <coughs> the reason why this is so exciting and why I believe this is the number one priority if you want to address not only the economic growth aspect, but actually civics and the, the issue of national security, is because it is only through that fundamental system modernization that you address every problem. What I've been saying to colleagues is we actually have a choice. We could spend the next few years running around putting out fires. And maybe we'll become good firefighters. Yeah? There's a fire, we respond quickly and we put it out. We could do that. But then we're probably going to look back five years from now and some of us will be voted out and then say, but you know what? Those fires keep happening. We will continue to be firefighters until the end of time. Or we could say, yes, there are fires and we must be firefighters but what we need to do is prevent the fires. And that is where the system reform comes in. So again, walk and chew at the same time. We have to deal with immediate problems. The crisis you have today, because someone's gonna lose a job offer, must be dealt with as a matter of urgency. 
but it is not sustainable to deal with problems on an ad hoc basis, including the backlog project. As good as it is, that's probably our best firefighting project if we get it right. But it's still firefighting. It's not prevention. And that is where I actually get to the thrust of my message, which is a very simple one. Please support publicly and indeed the transformation of home affairs into a digital first department. Full stop. Not more complicated than that. And if you need evidence, go and look at SARS and the Reserve Bank, actually. Those are, those are South African institutions run by the South African state, populated by South African civil servants. They've done it. We can do it too. And that is, that is, the, that is if you remember only one thing from me today, it is that message. Please support, endorse, back, and yes, fund where appropriate the reforms we need to build this. Now, I'm also very mindful, and, and I, I, I'm very straight with you about this. Before I entered politics, I had the privilege of working at Princeton University in the US for a few years as a researcher, traveling around Africa and Asia to look at government institutions that were successfully fixed, reformed. And there are amazing stories. I mean, uh, countries like Vietnam, Rwanda, um, you know, everything from a land administration system to tax administration, how do these reforms work? And one of the things that I'm very mindful of, and we have examples in South Africa, unfortunately, as well, is that's very easy to say, don't worry, we'll just have like some magic system and it'll fix everything. All your problems go away. It's a subtle point, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm not here to say to you, we want a Rolls Royce. Pay us billions and we'll bring you this thing and you won't hear from us for five years, but at the end, we'll push a button and everything will be fixed. But I think we must be very careful to avoid that. What I believe we need is a proof of concept. We need to demonstrate that we can automate home affairs processes. And most importantly, we need to automate adjudication where decisions are made in the system. It's vital on the permitting side, but I can tell you it's also vital in everything else that we do because it is in adjudication where currently the human element has far too much influence. Uh, that's why court cases happen. I hope no one is currently in, on my desk because I can tell you there are far too many <laughs> on my desk. But that is where corruption takes place. That is where... That is where mistakes are made. Because one of the most incredible things is that you can submit, and I know VFS helps us a lot here, I'm not criticizing them, but the point is it's still very much human-based, that you end up submitting an application without the requisite information. A computer doesn't let you click submit until you've put everything in. Really, it's 2024. And it, it can be that simple in many ways, but it is also extremely powerful. So what I would like to say to you is that in this initial phase, we must clear the backlog. We must cooperate better with stakeholders. I hope it speaks for itself. And then we must ensure the springboard process is in place. And here's where the real excitement comes in my view. If you can build a prototype, that says we'll take one category of visa application or we'll take one category, it doesn't have to be visas, everything Home Affairs does is adjudication. And we'll, we'll automate that and we're going to say, here's the workflow. If you've applied for permit A, permit A requires 10 things. Have you submitted those 10? Yes, you have. Right, next step. Are all 10 of those things authentic? Now, what do we have in the visa backlog? We have billions of data points. We have 306,000 applications that are now digital thanks to the hard work that's been going on. And what we need to do now is have a prototype and teach it what is a real police clearance and what is a fake police clearance. And I've, there's something called machine learning in this age. We can do it. We can do it far better than SARS could do it. They never had this. So if we are able to then seize this opportunity and get to a point where we can one day say, and I've said this to the president, that I've told him, I'm not promising you the sun, the earth, and the moon, but I, I will invite you to come and view the prototype. That's, that's my goal. 
If we can get there, we can demonstrate that this can work. And you can immediately hear the implications for the other parts of home affairs as well. This is not only about the economy. Imagine how much more secure our borders become the second you can no longer obtain a fraudulent visa. Because that's the implication of, of getting this right. So that is where I think in the immediate term the focus needs to be. And if we get that right, I really believe, and if we can demonstrate it, and again, you have, an, you have a role to play here. Uh, and there are, there are a little, there are a few too many ifs in what I'm saying, but, but that's the truth. If we get it right, then I ask you, tell people that they've gotten it right. It's that simple. Home affairs doesn't have to be only a punching bag. And actually, we all will struggle to get what we need if we view it only as a punching bag. Yes, when things go wrong, <laughs> the face is here. Do what you need to do. But when things go right, please have the same enthusiasm because that's ultimately far more important than putting out the fire, is preventing it. And, and, and so you can clearly hear that this is what I'm trying to convey. So that, I think, is how we link the vision of dignity which must inform everything we do across the three branches, how we relate that vision to this aspect and understand and embrace the economic potential that uh, speaks for itself, frankly, and then drill that down to a project level that is understandable, that is achievable, and that is a clear goal. And if you ask me what is the state of home affairs, Today, I tell you it is that we are there. We are right about at the moment where we can see how we get from the smallest project and change to the biggest vision of dignity. So we're right at the start. But I say to you, it's a start. I don't think it was there. I honestly say that. I think there was firefighting. And I think they were good firefighters, but I did not see a plan for preventing fires. I think we're getting there. And over the next few weeks and months, it is my job to define that, to make it into something that is clearly detailed and quantified and say, this is the plan, here are the steps involved, and then we must work together to make it work. Now, on the working together side, the other beautiful thing about understanding home affairs as a system problem that needs to be automated, is that we face a massive shortage of labor. And now again, all the business people here will understand what I'm about to say. We have an organization with 40% of the staff complement that it requires. It is the most dramatically underfunded department in the government. And especially, it is the most dramatically reduced budget in recent years. Last year, it was the number one, most reduced budget in the whole. Now, I'm very sorry. It's very easy to go and say, oh, we must fix the borders. Oh, you know, we're so angry about all these problems. We must fix the corruption. I say, show me your budget and I'll see your priorities. Home affairs is not a priority in the South African budget. It's a fact. It's not a criticism. It's not an attack on anyone. It's a fact. There are a lot of people who pretend that it's a priority. It's easy to say I care, but it's not being reflected financially. And I don't think that that's acceptable, but I also understand that I could spend the next five years just moaning about that. And then I'll blame the lack of money for the fact that there's still fires. And I think, don't think that's, that's pointless. So we sit with 40% of the human capacity we need. There is one advantage to that. And that is, firstly, it leaves you actually no choice but to automate. Because I can tell you right now there are officials doing jobs in home affairs. I mean, I hope our friends at the unions aren't listening. They are going above and beyond. Absolutely above and beyond. Because there's just not enough people. And I have actually said this to some of the union leaders as well. If you want to get a working environment that is dignified for officials at home affairs, you must automate because then they will actually, if everything goes right, just about be able to fulfill their task.
Because at the moment, they can't. You cannot expect an organization with 40% of the human capacity it needs and then demand 100% performance. But you can augment what, what, what that 40% can do. And that is why I'm also very clear that no one must come here and say, oh, it's about replacing people with machines. Nonsense. It is the machine making the person able to have a dignified work experience and actually do their job. If we were sitting at 100%, yeah, maybe it's a conversation we have to have. It's not a problem we have because there's not enough people. So I am absolutely confident in saying that that is not what this is about. And no one must even try and suggest it because I'll just come invite them to look at our budget. And then you tell me that any sane person here is talking about job losses. In fact, if we get this right, we'll actually have people capable of functioning at home affairs again. So, so that is the one side of, of cooperation and understanding where the links are between people and systems and, and what I'm talking about as, as the core of the problem. But I also want to say then that the rebuilding of the relationships is very important to me. And I think the reestablishment of the Immigration Advisory Board is really the clearest signal you can possibly get. It has not existed for many, many years. And the board, the reestablishment of the board's purpose is very simple, to do what the law says it must do. And that is to provide a forum where experts, people from government, organized business, organized labor, and people in the industry who understand these problems have the ability to comment, provide inputs, and actually genuinely advise. Someone asked me yesterday, why are you establishing the board? I said, it's in the name. <laughs> Advice, and, and I, but I realized this. I mean, I've not been in this job for long. I'm sitting on the opposition benches, no one cares. But suddenly when you're a minister, everyone cares. But what I noticed is that people don't seem to think that there's such a thing as genuinely getting advice. And that's, this is quite surprising to me. Uh, I'm not saying that when you consult with people, you do everything that they tell you, but you actually listen. And then if you don't agree with something, you say to them, but I don't agree for reason X, Y, and Z. And maybe the person who's coming from a different perspective makes a more persuasive argument. Didn't we learn this stuff when we were growing up? This is kind of how you function in society. But I find it genuinely shocking that people don't seem to understand that there's value in consultation. It is not a tick box exercise. Not if you want it to actually mean something. And so that is the purpose of the reestablishment of the board. Quite simply to say, here's a difficult problem. And yes, we've got some views, but please take a look. Does this make sense? Is there a different way to look at it? And I can tell you now, you're not going to agree with everything. The law doesn't require the minister to do what the board tells that person to do. But it sometimes feels like that's how it's interpreted by the politician. Oh, don't tell me what to do. No, please just listen and think it through. And that is how I think we must approach that. And, and I would encourage everyone And the 7th of September is the closing date. If you know good people, please apply. Those of you who did care when I was in opposition, I hope there's one or two of you in the room, will know that I was very much focused on the issue of politicization of, of civil service appointments and the idea that you can't create jobs for cronies because then you don't get value. So please be assured, there's no deployment and cadres and whatever in this. I'm looking for people who know what they're doing um, and, and including reflecting different views. And that's how we'll use the board going forward to, make actually, to actually make sure that we, we have different inputs when we make decisions. And I know it is something that affects you because I would really hope that when we go forward, we don't issue a regulation and then we have to change it a month later. It's a function of not having properly thought it through. And so that's, that's the goal with building that relationship. So with all of that being said, I just want to end off by maybe just drawing all the strings together and maybe just a few concluding thoughts. Uh, some people use the word poison chalice when I was appointed. That's a poison chalice. Why are we so defeatist in this country? How do you approach the opportunity to serve South Africa 
address something that has this enormous potential and go, oh, what a terrible thing, I've been poisoned. <laughs> no, 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 no. The challenges are there. They are huge. They are enormous. There's no beating around the bush there. But those things should energize us. They should motivate us to do something. Because I can tell you one thing, if we don't get this right, those challenges aren't going away. They aren't getting smaller. And that, I think, is the attitude that, to some extent, I hope we're already seeing reflected in home affairs, to say, you know what? Instead of being overwhelmed, let's use the motivation to show people that we can do it. Some of you will have noticed that everything I say is about team home affairs. So that's what I believe. This is a team effort, and that team includes not only our officials, it includes our clients. It includes people in this room. It's a team effort. I can promise you that there's no one with a magic wand. So, but, but if the team goes onto the field and says, oh, it's a poison chalice, we're going to lose to Ireland. I mean, we, we have to get visas now, so I can, I can have a stab at Ireland for, for making us get visas. Um, I mean, I, we'd never win anything. I don't think, I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't think Dr. Rassi would have that attitude, frankly. Yes, it's a big job. It's an enormous job. It's terrifying. But that is a reason to do it, not a reason to give up. That is the way we are approaching this. And because it's such a big job, there are going to be obstacles along the way. There will be mistakes. There will be unforeseen events. Things will happen and they will be bad. But I ask you only for the same thing I've been asking you throughout this address. And then I'm finishing, David, and we'll make it more interesting. I ask you only to genuinely support the reform effort. Not me, not an official, nothing besides if you are persuaded by what I've said today, to support those reforms happening. Because at the end of the day, if we sit here a few years later and we say home affairs looks more like SARS now in its operations uh, than anything else, then we would have succeeded. Doesn't mean there's no problems, doesn't mean everything along the way was perfect, but that is what matters to reform home affairs, to make it a place of dignity. Support that, please. Again, not the person, nothing beyond that. Support that effort. When the person strays from that vision, whether it's me, whether it's an official, whether it's someone you're interacting with, then that is where the punching happens. Then you remind that person that this is not what you're about. You are about what you've told us, a vision for dignity through embracing modernization and the opportunities of technology. And I think if we proceed in this way, like I told the president, there are no promises here, but there's a clear intent and a vision that if we proceed in this way, we can do something here that has meaning beyond home affairs. People in South Africa, to a very large extent, feel like this country can't get better. It's actually the most depressing way to think about your country. It's not even to say that the country is broken. It's to say that it can't be fixed, that there is no hope, that it's this inevitable downward slide and we don't know where the bottom is. That, that's, that's the reality. Now, I ask you, in conclusion, which government department would you put the label on that exemplifies that? And probably, if you're polite, you'll say it when you walk out, it's home affairs. Now, I say to you, if that is the case, then surely there is no better department to use as a living example that disproves the idea that things can never get better than home affairs. That doesn't mean home affairs or South Africa is going to be perfect five years down the road. But if home affairs can work, then South Africa also can work. That is why this matters. That is why I'm grateful to be here with you today. And that is why I ask you to support the vision. Thank you very much. <laughs>